Uh, my name's Marion Calmer, and first off, I want to say good morning. That wasn't too bad, but I think you can do a little better. Good morning. Good morning. That sounds wonderful. You're uh, probably sitting next to somebody you've maybe never met before. I always like to be friendly with my neighbors. So to start off with, first thing I want you to do is stand up and greet your neighbor and tell your neighbor how good looking they are today. All right, stand up real quick, greet your neighbor, tell them how good looking they are. <laughs> God, you're good looking today. Jesus, God. You ain't got a lot of me. <laughs> All righty, it's always great to start the day off with a compliment, and I'm sure your neighbor appreciated it as well as you did. So today we're going to talk about struggles with nutrient stratification. And uh, I picked this topic about a year ago. Uh, needless to say, I did not know that the price of fertilizer would double and how timely a subject that this would actually turn out to be. I had talked to these two guests that I have up here with me about maybe using the title Six Secrets to 600 Bushel Corn. How many would like to hear that one someday, huh? Hey, yeah, yeah. I like the, to hear. the problem is, I've heard these guys talk, I've seen them on TV, they're like a couple of politicians. I'm not sure they're going to uh, reveal their six secrets to five, 600 Bushel Corn. But, uh, so it, it reminds me of a story I'm going to start out with here. Back in the medieval days, they always had public ex executions once a month at the city square. So it came that day for the public execution. There was three gentlemen that walked up to the guillotine. The first guy was a robber. The guillotine operator says, have you got anything to say before your execution? The guy says, I I've been a thief. I apologize. I'll never do it again. Please let me go. Guillotine operator says, too late. Assume the position. So he pulls the string and the guillotine blade comes about halfway down and it shudders to a stop. The guillotine operator said, that's an act of God, you're free to go. So the, the thief got up, run off. Next guy was also a thief, got anything to say. I apologize for what I did, I'll never steal again, please let me go. The guillotine operator says, too late, pulls the string, the blade comes about halfway down and it shudders to a stop. Guillotine operator says, it's an act of God, you're free to go. He got up and he ran off. The third guy to come up was a farmer, and he'd cheated on his taxes. And the guillotine operator said to him, have you got anything you want to say before your execution? And the farmer says, yes. If you were to go over there and pick up that oil can and we were to oil up that track, I think we could get the blade to go all the way down. <laughs> so as farmers, and this is part of today's presentation, we're quick to identify problems. We also want to find solutions. So today, I'm the one that's struggling with stratification. And my two buddies up here are going to help us come up with some solutions. So I'm a fourth generation farmer from Alpha, Illinois, West Side. I also founded Calmer's Agronomic Research back in the middle 80s. I invented the world's first 12 inch corn head, the first 15 inch corn head the BT chopper that turns corn stalks into confetti, and I'm the founder and CEO of Calmer Cornheads. Our next guest is Mr. Randy Dowdy. He's a first generation farmer from uh, Georgia and first grower in history to surpass 500 bushels per acre. And he set two of the soybean records, one at uh, 171, the other one at 190, and he is also the founder of Dowdy Crop Innovations. We'll give Randy a nice round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> and my next guest is uh, Mr. David Hula, and he's a third generation farmer, and he partners in Redwood Farm Seed Company, and he set the world record two years ago at 616 bushels per acre, and he is an instructor for Dowdy Crop innovation next level program. So we've seen both of you. Uh, let's give David a nice round of applause. I do want y'all to know that Randy does not ever let me forget that he broke 500 first. <laughs> that, that's good. And you've been a little disrespectful. It's supposed to be King David. Oh, King David. King okay, David. I, I've, I've got that. Now, do you guys want to say anything about next level farming? Do I need to join your group because I, I could use some improving? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that on the tail end, Mr. Marion. <laughs> All righty. Sounds good. Well, we'll uh, hop in here. The, the, the things I want you to remember out of this presentation, again, I'm the one with the problem. These guys are the ones with the solution. But at my farm in western Illinois, I've been surface applying P&K for many, many years. I've been a no-tiller for a very long time. Stratification is very real at my farm. And I just identified it, started about four years ago, and I didn't realize how serious it was. Every time I take those soil tests, it keeps getting worse. The second thing I want to talk about, is there a yield penalty to having all of the nutrients in the top portion of the soil profile? I do not know the answer to that. These gentlemen might be able to help us. If we want to move to the next level, this is my, might be one of the ways we'll get there. But I can tell you, it takes a lot of time to gather good data, and we're going to show you how we grab that, that data. Now, in a year from now, I will have an idea of what the uh, yield gain uh, by, by the time you mix the nutrients in the soil profile. I, I want to encourage everybody to, to team up with your neighbors, or even yourself, or whatever. This picture is 30 years old. I'm on the, on the left side there in the green shirt. And my neighbors and I are looking at different row spacings in soybeans. And, and I like that statement. Um, on the left side of the screen. We can't improve on things we don't measure or research, first stated by Lord Kelvin. And, and I know these guys do research. That's how they got to the level where they are. I do research at my farm. This is how I identify what's working and what isn't. Take time, try some new things, make some mistakes. That's, that's how we learn. I'd also encourage you to join our team. Hey, Marion, you do know it's cheaper to learn from somebody else's mistakes than your own, right? It, that is correct. It is cheaper to learn from somebody else. And, and y'all, I want to emphasize things as he's saying. Marion said it was okay if I butted in with him, and it's hard to, I want to get an opportunity to talk. Both Randy and I do spend a lot of time researching. Um, you know, there, I heard the earlier group ask about foo foo juice or fairy dust. You know, that. Like Marion said, you can't improve on things you don't know that aren't working or yields, and that is extremely important. And as we're going to talk about today, he's doing a lot of research on his own operation, and each and every one of us have the ability to do the same thing. And as we explain what he's talking about on the stratification, we're going to focus on things that we both see at air operation and ways to manage it. And, but I just want to emphasize the fact that we're in an environment now that we're trying to save dollars, right? Because great opportunity to generate revenue, but there's a great opportunity to spend all the money we made last year. You bet. Thanks. So the thing that I want to emphasize is that as you're trying things, understand where you are before you really get into diving deep into the weeds. So you're going to talk about stratification. I got a quick question. Show of hands, who has pulled a soil sample 0 to 6, 0 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 24 inches? That's good. We've got some people We've out there doing this. We've got a few. But we need more. So where do the roots grow? In that top 24 inches? Yes, no, maybe. Yes. Do the roots grow? Yep. In that top 24 inches? They grow in somewhere, right? Would it be nice for the nutrients that are there when, they do, when the roots do find water that they be available? Absolutely. So we, we want you to join our team. Hopefully we'll be back next year. We're going to, I'm going to provide a free soil probe. This is the one that I use for zero to eight, and the reason I use it is because it opens up so that I can cut it up into one inch increments. And I'll show you a little video a little bit later on. These are free. You can stop by our booth. We'll either mail it to you. You can pick it up, take it home with you. All we ask for in return, send us the data. We want to find out how serious is this nutrient stratification problem. I've been no-tilling, I've been putting fertilizer on top of the ground for the last 20, 30 years, and I've just now realized that is a bad thing to do. Stratified soils, uneven level of nutrients at various depths within the soil profile. I'm going to show you my data, and I, I am the perfect <coughs> definition of stratified soils. When I was a kid, I used to come home from school, I'd get on the old tractor, take the fertilizer buggy, go uptown. They'd fill it with fertilizer, I'd bring it home. At that point in time, it was called plow down. How many of you used to do that when you were younger? And we'd bring it home, we'd spread it on the corn stalks, and we would plow it down. And the reason is because phosphorus only moves about an inch, and potassium maybe moves two inches. 
So I've got plots. My plots are 60 foot wide at my farm. And somewhere over time, over the last 30, 40 years, some of us have moved to no-till, it's become acceptable to put the nutrients on top of the ground. And so over the last 14 years in this particular plot we're going to talk about, I've spent $936. It only grew me an extra $395 worth of grain. And I kept track of it every year. So that means I'm spending a dollar for P and K and I was only getting 40 cents back in grain. I knew something was wrong. And Dr. Belo's in the room right here up front, wave your hand. And he came to my farm and he stood out there and he said, Marion, you've got nutrient problems. And I said, my profile's just fine. And he said, well, it's not showing up. Your corn plants show that they're suffering from nutrient deficiencies. So, I've been applying them on the surface. I'm gonna to turn to these two gentlemen. I'm gonna ask them, how do you guys apply your nutrients? Randy, fire away. Well, we're big advocates of using chicken litter, and we do buy some commercial fertilizer, and we broadcast everything. The difference between, and I say broadcast it, we've started in the last four to five years using, you know, strip till, and we've been strip tilling for removal of compaction for a long time, but now we've started banding fertilizer. And you want it to grow in a root zone, right? And Absolutely. So depending on where you're placing that fertilizer, we've been using a tool in the past, I guess, three years now, where we place it in the top three to four inches. But one of the things that I have done and where I was going a few minutes ago, we did pull those soil samples, you know, four or five years ago. And we pulled the soil samples, okay, where are we from zero to eight? Where are we from our eight to 16? Where are we from our 16 to 24 inches in nutrients? The next thing we did is we took a soil moisture probe that measures CEC. And when it measures CEC, or EC, that we could actually see salt content movement through the profile. So where is the salt content coming from? The fertilizer. A lot of people use a soil moisture probe to be able to identify where moisture is and whether or not they need to irrigate or how they need to pray for rain. We used the probe to tell us where our fertilizer was located in relationship to where the moisture was being removed. If there's moisture being removed from that area, we need fertilizer to be available in that area. Would you agree? So it, it made just walking around sense for us. But one of the things that we've done from 10 years ago when we started this and, and recently as late as five years ago, when we looked at our zero to eight, eight to 16 to 16 to 24 inches, there was a lot of variance in our, our pH and our fertility levels. Today, there's very little difference. Great. Now, right. how, how do we get, I ain't through, give me a minute. All right, go ahead. So there's very little difference today. How did we do that? Especially when we're surface applying that strip with, you know, surface applying that chicken litter in most of our fertilizer in the top three to four inches. How do we get it down to 24 inches? Cover crops. We have something growing 300 days a year. Why does it not 365 days? Because we're plowing, planting, or harvesting. Right? We're getting ready to plant. We're harvesting in those other 65 days. We're in the south. We get warm temperatures. We got biological activity that happens 350 plus days of the year. We'll get 15 to 20 days a year at max where our soil temps drop below 50 degrees. But we've got a living root mass that's going, growing in that zone that's moving that fertility up and down. Now, a lot of you guys can't do that because you're not in South Georgia or in our climates. But you did mention something in one of your slides that potash or potassium doesn't move but two inches. Right. Come to Georgia and I guarantee you it'll, it'll move. move more than two inches with our All three right. to CC. Well, we'll have a few more uh, slides and opportunities to jump in. David, how, how do you put your nutrients on? Well, um, uh, you gotta realize where I'm at. So I'm in the, y'all ever heard of the Chesapeake Bay? And you do know what flows downhill, right? And so I'm just two, two and a half hours south of DC. So um, <laughs> it's really flowing today. Yeah. I always wondered how you grew that high yield yeah. corn. Now I know. So, um, so in order to, before we make any nutrient applications, we're pulling soil samples. 
And then we've gone from field soil samples to what probably a lot of growers are doing to zone samples and then we went into two and a half acre grids and then this guy right here convinced me to pull one acre soil samples. So before you start planting a nutrient, you've got to understand what you have. But then other than just pulling a surface sample, we got to where we were doing the same type thing Randy was doing but in different increments where Ms. Jamarian's talking just pulling eight inch samples, we're doing four, four to eight, eight to 12, and then 12 to um, 16. 18, and then 18 to 24. So now we're measuring what we have on the top. Also, what do we have that the roots can tap into, and then where some of our nutrients might have slowed down. And we get that little stratification at the top. We'll talk about this later. So how do we make our nutrient applications? We were broadcast, and we're big on lime, first and foremost. And then we were dependent on part of our rotation, how we, what nutrient we're applying. We got to where we kind of deviated from just the broadcast to now where we're strip tilling. We run a soil warrior. And we're going to, working up a zone three to four inches deep, eight inches wide. Now, we're not getting it down into the deeper profile, but the only nutrient that we're stratifying is their phosphate that we've noticed. So broadcast, transition to strip till, but the most important thing you gotta focus on is you gotta know what you have in your soil first and foremost. So irregardless how you sample, consider going to these one acre zones, or if you hadn't done zones, go to two and a half, but then look down the road, because there is way more variability. And Randy's told me the big difference is that it's like looking at an X-ray or an MRI. They're the differences that you see. And with the value of fertilizer or the price of the fertilizer, you want to be as efficient as you can today. All right, sounds, sounds awesome. So these are my soil tests on an average. So if you're a, parts per, or a pound per acre guy like I am in Illinois, uh, my top eight inches, I've got 65 pounds per acre on phosphorus. Uh, 278.6 pounds per acre on potassium. If you're a parts per million person, look at the bottom, the blue line, 32.5 or 139.3. Now my organic matter levels are 3.2 and through the top eight inches, I have uniform distribution. My earthworms are doing their job because it's like 3.2, 3.3, 3.2, 3.1. And it's, it's even all the way down. My CECs run around 23. So how do we get this data? The first time I did it, and I, these guys are explaining a little bit of how they're doing it, uh, I had four bags. Uh, the one on the left is zero to two, two to four, four to six, and six to eight. My first shot at finding out how serious of a stratification problem did I have at my farm. You can see the tape measure, you can see the soil probe. Sent it off to the lab, and much to my amazement, did I ever have stratification. So we're going to start in 2018, it's on the left side of the screen, up at the top, zero to two. 108 pounds per acre in the top two inches. 2020, I came back and did the same spot, the same way, I'm at 113. Continue to apply more surface fertilizer and come back in 2021, and now I'm at 119. It shows me at my farm in the same spot, if I continue to apply surface phosphorus and potassium, 108, 113, 119. It's getting worse, not better. So what are you applying there, Marion? What we're applying is uh, $50, and I don't know the pounds, but we spend 50 bucks an acre before we plant soybeans. We have put on $100 an acre before we plant corn. So I'm, I'm always looking at profitability, uh, and we can go dig up that information if you want. Good question, though. All right, so down in the bottom, lower left-hand corner in the red, 2018. The, my bottom two inches where the roots are at, I've only got 44 pounds per acre. In 2020, it's down to 43, and in 2021, it's down to 42. So the top numbers are getting higher, the bottom numbers are getting lower. I've got stratification and it's getting worse. So gentlemen, tell us a little bit about stratification and what happens in a dry year and what happens in a wet year. Well, phosphorus does not move very well for us. Hence, how many people is going to use two by two or is using two by two? Raise your hands. Are you putting it below the seed or above the seed or beside the seed? If you're planting seed at two inches, I like to put it below the seed because I've got to depend on what? 
either a different set of roots tapping into this or some movement to get into the root zone. What about all those surface applying? Do roots grow this way? They're not supposed to, right? So it's a big deal whether you're, you're applying the fertilizer with a strip-till rig or whether you're doing it with a planter or you're broadcasting it. You know, it makes a difference. It's got to be available for us to get maximum ROI. So in a dry year, how do we get it in solution? Right. How do we get it to move into the root, root zone? So one nice thing that we have is we got an irrigation pit. We can make it rain. We can get it into solution and have a little bit of an effect, especially when we have 50 to 60 inches of annual rainfall that also helps us make that happen. Now, for a lot of you guys, you don't get 50 to 60 inches of annual rainfall. We're supposed to get five inches this week. If I had planted like a lot of people have in my area, what would you be asking yourself? By Saturday, we're supposed to have five inches of rain. Where would you be asking yourself with five inches of rain, where's all my fertilizer? Well, five it inches of rain. definitely makes a difference in Georgia. With CECs or what? You got to explain three, that to them. Our CECs are three to five, three to seven. So we don't have a lot of holding capacity. So for us, absolutely a dry year and a wet year makes a difference so in, your in availability. Cation, your cation exchange capacity is single digits? Yes, sir. Welcome and to I'm 23 or whatever. Dr. Yes. Bilo, is that quite a bit of difference? Big difference. Big difference. Big okay. Difference. All right. Good, good one. David, do you want to jump in here? Um, I mean, <clears throat> I, I agree everything with what Dowdy had said. I guess the elementary question is, where do roots grow? Yeah, I like to pose this with groups. Where, where do roots grow? Somebody yell the answer out. Not a next level guy. <laughs> Most people say in the soil, right? It's not true. They're growing moisture. If it's dry, they're not growing. So until you have moisture there, so if you're not having, if you're in a dry year and you don't have moisture, roots aren't really growing. And then you got to understand, well, how does roots pick up nutrients? Either bumps into it or mass flow, it moves across the root, or something's bringing it. And, you know, the, when y'all go into trade show, you're going to see a lot about fairy dust, the biology, how we can stimulate that. So, obviously, in a dry year, roots aren't picking up nutrients. In a wet year, they are. Now, unless it's hydroponics or something, we're just too wet, an anaerobic environment. So, you got to have roots where the nutrients are, and then they have to be available. And that's what we're going to be, I mean, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Yep, Ex excellent point. And I noticed at my farm, in the dry years, my corn looks like crap. And in wet years, I'm, I'm okay. But it just, they're exactly right. You got to have moisture or it doesn't do you any good. Okay. Um, despite how you apply the P and K. Despite how you apply. Here's how I do the, uh, um, let me see if I can get this video to play. And uh, this, is, this is how I take this soil sample, and it's really important to get accurate data. Let's see if I can make it run. Uh, no audio. How wonderful. All right, so what you can see in front of me is uh, eight bags, <coughs> zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six, six to seven, seven to eight. I've also got the green tape measure that's down there in front of me. You can see the soil probe and you can see how it opens up. And this is the reason I use this style of soil probe because now the buck knife that's at the very bottom of the screen, I can take the buck knife and I can cut it up into one inch increments. And, and it almost takes two people to do this because it, it's a windy day, the bags are gonna wanna blow around, they're gonna get mixed up, and you wanna make sure that you absolutely positively get it in the right bag. Now. I park the pickup truck out in the middle of the field in the same spot every year, and I use the tailgate for my little table to, to do this. And you can see there where I'm cutting it up with the buck knife one inch at a time, and you only put one little probe in. So I have to go like 30 times around the pickup truck in order to be able to get that uh, uh, enough soil so I can send it to the lab. I'll keep explaining it. You're doing a great job. You're right. living right. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I would suggest you have two people. The soil probe's going to want to tip over on you. There's just a whole lot of little obstacles that could go wrong while you're out there. But 
two people r really help uh, do this. And then once I get it into the bags, I let it air dry because it's going to be clay and it's, and it's going to be wet and it's going to be gummy and it doesn't mix real well. So I let it air dry in the shed for a few days and then I pour it into the food processor right here. If you go in the house with the significant others, not home, grab it, fill it full of soil, and then you put it on top there and you grind it all up into powder and then you put it back into the appropriate bag, clean it up, take it back in the house, put it exactly where you found it. She will never know that you borrowed her little food processor to grind up your soil. If you make a smoothie and it tastes like dirt, add a little more vodka and you'll never know that there's dirt mixed in, in with it. But I do want to say thanks. Uh, I did this work last fall. My daughter helped me take the first set of tests. Uh, she's here, Eliza, and my girlfriend, Teresa, <laughs> helped me do the second set because my daughter said, it's too much work. I'm not going out there the second time. And so they're up front here. Stand up. Let's give them a nice round of applause. Teresa, my girlfriend, and my daughter there, Eliza. All right, grab a helper, get those soil tests. So, Marion, before, before you show the data. Yeah, um, oh, oh, wait a second, okay, I'll yeah, back up. All before right. you show the data, not everybody's going to have a probe like this. So, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Bilo here would say something very similar. If you have a regular open face probe and you do this, because that's how I do ours, because we want to pull deeper samples and you clearly can't go past this because it's going to stop. If you have an open face probe, you know, you're going to typically, you're going to push down and then you might want to either pull it straight up or twist it. And when you pull it out of the ground, the soil in the bottom is running through the soil on the top. I don't have a lapel mic, so now I got to sit back down. Um, so the soil in the bottom of the probe, as it moves, as you pull it up, you're going to capture some nutrients on the, on the top layer of the soil. So then you want to take that same pocket knife or something and scrape the dirt off if you have an open set face probe, because we sure don't want to contaminate the data because not everybody's going to have a probe like this. You're going to use what you already have. So I just want to emphasize that. Well, oh, he's giving them great away point. for free. So <laughs> they're going to get it for free. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's oh, I understand. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to supply you with a probe. You can stop past our booth, pick it up, take it home. We'll mail it to you. All we ask for in return, we want to find out how serious of a problem do we have nationwide. I think it's pretty serious because there's a lot of us have been no-telling, a lot of us have been surface supplying, and I think this problem is a lot, a lot bigger than we think, and these two guys are good examples of what happens when you get rid of stratification, how, how fast your yields take off. All right, let's move on. So here's the data. One inch at a time, zero to one, right at the top, we're talking about phosphorus, 142 pounds per acre in the top inch. On a dry year, I've got no roots up there. It does me no good to surface apply nutrients and leave them on the surface. One to two inches, the, the lighter green, 97 pounds per acre. In Illinois, University of Illinois would tell us 50 pounds per acre is adequate in, in the top eight inches. I'm, I'm screaming in the top two inches. And you look on down through the profile, I've got declining numbers and we get down to the bottom Six to sevens at 47 pounds per acre, seven to eights, 37 pounds per acre. That means, as, as these guys have talked, and I'm telling you the same thing, 46% of my nutrients in the soil profile are above the seed. And, I, and I'm 65 years old, I've been farming my entire life, and I'm just looking at this and I'm going, where, where, why haven't I figured this out sooner? But the, the whole profile, has an average of 65. To anybody in fertility, that looks great. But the difference from top to bottom is 105 pounds per acre. My roots are starving for nutrients, and the top up there, gosh, you know, when it rains, what, what happens to them? All right, let's take a look. If you guys are all right, I'm going to look at potassium. These guys are staring at there, going, wondering, where's Marion been all these years? All right, now we're going to talk about potassium. Zero to one. 569 pounds per acre in the top inch. I got very few roots in the top inch and if it's dry, it's doing me no good. I spent all that money doing me no good. One to two, 377 pounds. Continued declining numbers as I moved to the lower part of the profile. Six to seven inches at 183. 
seven, eight inches at 177. Now the average was 279. In Illinois, we would like to be at 350, so I'm a little low on my potassium, a little high in that eight inches. The problem is the difference from top to bottom is almost 400 pounds per acre. I, it, just, it just floors me. All right, so let's, let's take a question for these guys right here. And, and if you guys have never had stratification, maybe you haven't had to take countermeasures, but maybe when you first started farming 20 years ago, did, did you guys do something to, to, to rectify the, the stratification problems? I think I've explained mine. I mean, what we've done is, you know, to hold the world together, we've put cover crops out there. We have them at 150 to 100 pounds, depending on uh, which product we're using and the timing of the year that we actually plant it. But we use triticale, oats, rye, whatever we've, we've got, and we'll plant a cover crop. And we use that in the fall, then we're planting, obviously in the spring, we'll plant corn or peanuts or soybeans, and then we'll plant another crop in the late summer. So we've always got something growing. So that, that's our best friend and how we've been able to accomplish what we've been able to do to Perfect. remove the stratification. Perfect. Now we're doing some strip tilling. Good. David, did yeah, you ever have um, it when you first started farming? Well, well when I first started farming, but I, I, I think I'd rather talk about what happened in 1986. Uh, my late dad... Um, so wanted to do some continuous no-till, and we, we've been no-tilling corn and soybeans, and you know, we've been broadcasting fertilizer. We got away from the plowing. Uh, Chesapeake Bay, you can't have any runoff, because that's where your phosphorus goes, just like you're talking. It's yep. in the top. So when you get rainfall, soil movement, that's where a lot of your phosphorus is. So we started this continuous no-till against some of Virginia Tech's recommendations, because no-till weed into corn residue creates, if you're in a small grain, you can get mm -hmm. vomitoxin or scab, or Fusarium head blight. Uh, but we were persistent in doing that, and we, we picked a field that was three miles down a dirt road from our home base because we were committed. If it didn't look good, we didn't have to look at it every day, but we were going to stick with it. And I just when Marion said we were going to do this, I went out in that very same field and pulled a sample similar to what he did, but not in four in single in inch increments. We did that four to eight, and then four, eight to 12. And the top you know, we were getting that 99, now I'm at parts per million, so 99 parts per million of phosphate, and then in the top four, and then the next four, we dropped down to 51, still enough to grow a good corn crop, and our potash was not nearly as dramatic, because we're in low CECs like Dowdy, four, we were 4.9 in this particular field. So our soils are moving our potash because rainfall. We are getting taken advantage of the earthworms, I mean, you just go out there and just prolific with earthworms. So we're getting that movement there. And then we don't, can't do cover crops on every acre, but we are three crops in two years, corn, small grain, double crop beans. So we have a, an environment that residue is decaying. The biology is moving the nutrients further down. And now we still have not ever strip tilled in this one field. So we see this stratification in the top four inches, but then from there down, it's, it's almost like a mono system. It is the same. Good, good, great, great explanation. All right, so I decided to come up with a method <laughs> to change the way my soil profile looked. I wanted to turn it upside down. I wanted all the nutrients in the bottom and very few nutrients in the top. So just one plot, just one plot, um, about two and a half acres in size, grabbed the old tractor, the old moldboard plow I had when I was in high school, and I went out there and I plowed about eight to nine inches deep. Now, I wasn't able to, to pull it very fast, and I was only able to stand that slab of soil vertical. I, I needed a little more speed to be able to get that profile to, to roll all the way over. I was trying to turn it upside down. I was unsuccessful at it. So. Now what we're going to show you, the next slide, I'm going to show you what it looked like before I moldboard plowed, only two acres on the farm, came back to exactly the same spot and retested. So here, you just saw this data, five, we're, we're going to look at just potassium only, 569 on the top inch, and at the bottom down there, the red is at 177. And that is exactly opposite of how roots grow. So I moldboard plowed, same spot. And sure enough, we, we moved the same nutrients, 
We just redistribute them in the soil. Who's so, still running the mold boil plow? There, I see one hand, maybe two. Who it, should be running the mold boil plow? <laughs> it's, it's hard to, you know. Your, your ancestors were smarter than what you think. And they call Or maybe you need, give me one more second. All right. Or maybe you need to think about a way to place fertilizer deeper because you're eliminating part of the problem. Now, what if you could take and place it 12 to 14 inches deep? Good, good point. And, and so uh, when, when you look at this, uh, there was a reason they called it plow down when I was a kid because you needed to put it in the soil. So anyway, I got the majority of the nutrients down there. 377 is at that three to four inch level, but I was unsuccessful at being able to increase the nutrient level in that seven to eight inch area. It's How many mobile plows will be in this? Huh? How many mobile plows will be in the How trade shed? How many of you shed? still have the old moldboard plow at home? Oh, we got quite a few. How many are they going to advertise in the trade show today? <laughs> My Francis, Francis Childs wasn't as dumb as what we thought, right? Right. And, and Pretty smart fellow. But I'm not sitting here going to tell you that this is a no-till problem. It's, it's, it's a Marion Calmer problem or whatever because I surface applied it. I'm the one that did it wrong. And, and the plow is just one way to show what I should have been doing years ago, which was putting it in the soil, not on the soil. There's, there's a huge difference in there. So at home, if you still got the old mulberry plow, take two acres and do exactly what I did. Mark a spot, take the test before you moldboard, moldboard it, take the test afterwards. Nobody right. in NRCS is in this room, right? <laughs> it might be an issue. Yeah, make sure you're on a non-highly rotable ground. Okay, here's something that I really think is, is, is a no-no. Frozen ground underneath, I got snow that's on top, it's melting, and we're spreading fertilizer into the snow. When the snow melts, where's it gonna go? Gonna go down to the river, gonna go down to the creek. It, it, it's just really sad. The other thing, I've been uh, surface applying for quite a while, let me back up one. Here you can see the crystals of uh, phosphorus and potassium right there on the soil, and uh, when it rains, they're gonna liquefy, and, and they're gonna go on down there. So on a hard rain, if it's on the surface, it, it's going to end up going down the creek. I'm in the Mississippi River watershed. We're right here in New Orleans for the exit of the Mississippi River. And I have been down here 30 years ago with the ag team talking to the EPA people about hypoxia. It is a naturally occurring event that happens at the mouth of all large rivers in the world. The Nile, the Amazon, and the Mississippi. It happens during the month of June because of the nutrient loading that takes place during snow melt in the upper Midwest. And they told me that part of the problem could be a slight jump in the level of phosphorus. Now, it's normally associated with nitrogen, but I can also tell you somewhat phosphorus. No matter how you look at it, I'm spending a, a bunch of money for nutrients. I don't want them to leave my farm. I want them to stay where I put them. All right. Gentlemen, do you root zone band your fertilizer? If so, how deep? Eight inches wide, two to three inches deep. Eight inches wide and two to three inches. How do you get it eight inches wide? Soil warrior. The soil warrior. And does it have shovels on it or is it just a knife shank? It's a three colder system. Three colder system. Mm -hmm. All right, yep. sounds good. Mr. Uh, Hula. Yeah, well, first and foremost, we're getting ready to run the soil warrior too. so. You know, when I think about strip tailing, I only think of one. I think of the soil warrior, so it's kind of synonymous. But that, that's doing in that three, eight inch wide, three, four inches deep, depends on how deep we want to run the cultures. But that's just my potash, some sulfur, some zinc, a little bit of phosphate, and what a little bit of nitrogen comes with the uh, map. But the other thing is in, in banding fertilizer, and Dowdy hit it earlier, is the guys that are using starter, you know, and I'm not talking in furrow. That, that's a, that's in furrow. That's not starter. I'm talking side placement of fertilizer. If you're going to do that, leaving it on top is just amplifying what Mr. Marion's talking about. So we, I personally think that there is not a perfect side placement system out there yet. John Deere has the deep placement and can possibly get it four inches deep, but that's only on one side. I mean, I'm sitting next to a guy that just started farming. When did you start farming, Randy? <laughs> Corn was in 2008. Yep, 2008. And came up with the idea of put, if corn, what side do corn roots grow on? They grow on both sides of the plant, don't they? So why do we just put starter on one side? 
So we invented this side placement starter on both sides. Why didn't we come up with that a long time ago and the equipment folks hadn't figured out how to do a deep placement on both sides yet. So we're just, try we're just enhancing what Mr. Marion's talking about when we're using starter. So I until, well you did, but you got equipment. You got different equipment <laughs> than we do up in the real world, man. We got narrow goat paths, roads and stuff. Can't get that stuff down there highway. <laughs> And, and what I'm referencing is we just took a toolbar, made a parallel toolbar that runs in front of the planter toolbar. So we've got a seven by seven bar that the rail units are mounted on. We have a parallel roll, two, parallel toolbar that runs just in front of that. And we've got two by two coders that can go four to six inches deep. So they're totally independent of you know the row unit or the seven by seven bar that the row unit's mounted to. So. And for all you guys that are running 40 and 60 foot planters, good luck on figuring out a way to make it fold or stack fold oh or any of that. And it's heavy. It adds a lot of weight. So, but where there's a will, there's a way. But that did sound like a challenge. When King David speaks, they listen, right? So maybe John Deere or somebody can come up with a way to deep place starter fertilizer while planting. Awesome. Good, good comments. All right, we're gonna, and we're doing pretty good on time here. We're, we're optimistic we're gonna have time for some questions. So back in 1985, that's when I started doing on-farm independent ag research. I'm on the left of the screen, and a, a very famous individual by the name of Herman Warsaw from Central Illinois uh, was the first one to reach 370, and he set the record, and I got to see that crop grow in the field. Herman's a phenomenal man, very humble. A lot of fertilizer, a lot of cattle manure. What time of year was that when you took that picture? Um, July probably, late July, first part of uh, August. Okay, um, when would he have harvested that corn? Say again? When would he have harvested that corn? And that I'm not aware of. Looks like it's just started. But I know he was in 28 inch rows. Do y'all see how green that corn is? Mm -hmm. Next yep. slide. All right, so that was 1985. All right, so now, a few years later. What I time had of the year was this? In the summer. <laughs> you see those ears? You see what it looks like? See how green that corn is from top to bottom? Yep. That's it's, it's good. I never noticed that. Good, good point. And uh, so I got to meet Francis Child. We were on a program together in Minnesota. Great guy. 2002. He set the next record at 442. I, I, I'm just so amazed that I got to see these crops grow in the field and get to talk to these gentlemen. And a couple years ago, Randy walked into my booth and he said, Marion, I'm interested in narrow row corn. And I said, we build narrow row corn heads. And he said, I'd like to use one. And he planted 15 inch corn and Randy went to 521. Again, I, I feel so privileged to get to, to meet these individuals. And then, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of your corn crop. I'm assuming it would be green. In the, in the summer. Our time. combine kills the. I like to mess with David. When, one thing about next level, next level of tours, we do tours and we go to farmers' fields in June and July time frame, but we also go back when we got ears to look at. And we go back in August, September. And I typically will harvest corn in the end of July, 1st of August. And I'll mess with David because he'll be at a farm camp and I'll, I'll take a video of the yield monitor and I'll also pan out and let him see how green the corn is. We kill corn with the combine. If your corn's not dead due to a frost, due to a frost, it's senescing and it's dying too quickly and you're leaving a lot of yield on the table. You should kill it with the combine. Absolutely. Period. Okay. And so, uh, two I years think ago. I David wants to say something. Yeah, Randy, I was at one of the camps, I don't remember which one, and Randy sends uh, well, me a video, and I knew, you know, how easy is it to take a combine, grab the joystick, take a picture of the yield monitor? You know, that's one thing. I didn't even need to see the yield monitor. When Dowdy's harvesting corn, and it is almost black green, I about wanted to throw my field in the highway and run up, my phone in the highway and run over it, because I was pretty disgusted, because he just probably rung the bell that year. And, um... So the same thing, because I know when, you know, I've been on at no-till conferences with Mr. Marion, but I was at an event down, I think, in Mike Denton's um, camp down in, um, was that Princeton? Princeton, Illinois. Princeton, Illinois, and he had a little field day, and uh, we were talking about running the 
super choppers, and I was describing what our corn's like when we harvested. You know, we can grow some long season corn, 119, 120 day hybrids, and it might be cab might the corn might be up to the top of the cab tassel wise, and we run the header on the bottom of the ground, and I'm wanting some of these super choppers and Misty Marion's word to death that I'm turning that corn head into a, <laughs> cho a green uh, uh, chopper. solids chopper. And I'm going to use his super choppers to do that. Well, they survived it. There's no doubt. So um, Randy's right. You, if you don't have a frost and your corn's not green, at least ear leaf on, on up, there, there's, you have left significant yield on the table. Well, I got an interesting story. I, I, I heard David talk <laughs> the summer he grew the, the summer before he grew the 600 bushel corn. And he just put the super choppers on his corn head. And, and, he, and he stood up there in front of everybody and said, this year it looks like it's going to start with a six. He said, I've got two ears. It looks really good. He said, I'm going to have a whale of a corn crop. He got done talking and he walked down. I said, David, I got something to tell you. He goes, what's that? I said, I can guarantee you my super choppers have never been tested in 600 bushel corn. And I'm not so sure if the slip clutches are going to go or whatever. And he just put them on. I mean, he turned white as a ghost. He's just like, oh my. And, and I got to, Randy, I got to tell this story. So I, I, it's during harvest. Randy calls me on the phone. He's, he's running one of our 15 inch heads. And he goes, Mr. Mary, and he's, when, he, when he's harvesting, I mean, he's, he's a scatterbrain. And he's on the phone. He said, the auger just quit turning. Said, what, what do I do? What do I do? I said, well, look down and see if the chain broke. And he goes, where, where, where's the chain at? I said, it's on the left hand side. I'm looking from the cab. I can't see it. I said, well, it's underneath the shield. You have to take the shield off. <laughs> I quote, Randy said, Marion, does that mean I have to get out of the cab and go down there and take the shield off? That's a true story, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I'm just like, oh, he said, I have people that do that for me. And I'm like, okay, okay. Well, I probably had a tropical storm coming, <laughs> truth be known. <laughs> well, anyway, so let's talk, I, you know, great guy. You two are, are using cover crops. I am not. Tell me your thoughts. Are, are cover crops, do they, there are certain cover crops, I would assume, are part of the problem because they suck the nutrients out of the ground and move it to the top. And there's other cover crops that suck the nutrients from the top and move it down to the bottom. Tell, tell me what you think, guys. Well, I'm using a cover crop to hold the world together, but also to capture residual fertility that's being mineralized. We're breaking down, with our soil temps <clears throat> stand above 50 degrees as long as they are, our microbial activity really never stops. So that fertilizer is becoming available. When we break down that corn fodder, we, we harvest that corn into July. By the time we harvest the soybeans that we planted behind that corn in December, there's not a corn cob in the field that said that corn was there four months ago. Not a stalk, not a corn cob, not a leaf. Four months later. So that's one reason why we can't build organic matter very well, is it just 100% just getting constantly turned over. But we like to plant a cover crop that's going to hold the world together. We normally use some kind of rye, oats, wheat, triticale, something like that. We have played around with the turnips and some of the, the deep radishes, the tillage radishes and things like that. And for us, we don't get cold enough. It becomes a problem. We can't, we'll grow a radish this long. Most wow. of it's out of the ground. Wow. And then we have a problem with it taking and trying to get rid of it so the planter doesn't bounce because we don't have enough cold weather and enough freezing to make that tillage radish to go away. So for us, it's just more about small grain. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to agree with Dowdy. I'm, we do a little bit of cover crops. We do play with the tillage radish. It's nothing worse than to plant 300 acres of this tillage radish, not get cold enough so it doesn't winter kill. Then you go out and spray it and kill it, and your landowner is all excited about it until it starts to decay. <laughs> Dave, that's a great project, but it sure does smell. Wow, I understand. So don't do it again. But what we did notice, where whether before it all started growing above ground, you know, we were getting some pores opening up, and as it decayed, you know, you could find dirt that were crumbling in it, particularly after you planted or something like that, or just ran some equipment. Um, that's where, as you go through the trade show, you know, they got these cover crop mixes. So to address the point that Marion's saying, some of the nutrients, you know. I'm in a watershed. I don't want to lose any of my nutrients. Go down in the water, in the groundwater, but then also I don't want it to run off. So we're doing both, pulling up, pushing them down. A lot of guys in Kentucky and Tennessee are doing these five-way, seven-way, nine-way mixes. 
mean, if you want to add a legume in there and you've got enough time to actually let it get enough growth to, you know, provide some residual nitrogen, go for it. I don't care. We just use, because we've got so much micro, micronutrient, or excuse me, microbial activity, we're breaking down all that residual fodder from all year. We just, we don't seem to get the benefit and enough growth. Wonderful. Well, like I said, I've had the privilege of knowing all four of these gentlemen with the common thread. All four of these guys are big proponents of putting the nutrients in the root zone. The problem that I have at my farm is I was putting the nutrients on top of the soil and roots don't grow up, they grow down. And uh, the other thing is these guys all grow world record yields. I struggle at my farm to consistently grow over 250, 275. I'm beginning to think it's not the teachers <laughs> that are the problem, it's the student that's the problem. So I'm, I'm paying attention today here, hoping to take it home to my home farm. I, I don't think that a field cultivator is going to be a solution to stratification because it only mixes half of the depth of tillage. So if you're field cultivating four inches deep, you're maybe going to get the nutrients two inches deep. I don't think that's deep enough. Here's what we've been talking about, strip tilling, uh, blowing the nutrients down in the soil profile. Uh, I'm not sure whose model this, this is, but one of the thoughts that I've had and I've heard talked about is can we go ahead and plant corn on the strip and then I plant 15 inch beans, I'm corn beans, corn beans, corn beans. And then when I come back with, with beans, can I straddle the old corn row and plant beans on both sides so that the soybean has a shot at getting down into that zone and looking for the... Well, one so, of the things that we've been asked numerous times with banding fertilizer is what's the effect on cover crops, small grains for seed or for to, to, to sell. I think David can probably address this. Um, yeah, I, I mean, when, when we first got into the running the soil warrior, I was worried death because I got corn, then I got no-till small grain right behind that, but we ran the uh, strip till in front of the corn. And I thought I'd get this wavy motion and we've we've run strips in the same strips for two rotations now and I'm not getting this wavy motion so that has not been an issue and I think it is part of, part of the reason is because the roots once they get below that stratification layer they've evened out nutrient wise perfect that, that's uh, that's great all right we have got uh, another thought here this is the soil warrior and and they are exhibitors here I believe and and are, is this what both of you run Yes, sir. yes, yes, sir. I've got a three-position tank, so we can do three different products. But okay. We can variable rate at the same time, so we, we'll typically have a, a straight-rate blend going across with, say, nitrogen and some micros or just whatever we're doing, and then we can actually take P and K and variable rate it across the field if we need it. Sounds good. You got any other comments, David? No, I'm, I'm same You're thing. Good. All right, and I've seen you both on on TV. And uh, so anyway, the, to wrap it up here, we're going to start to open it up for a few questions. I, I'm going to tell you, I, these two guys are going to tell you, stratification is real if you surface apply your P and K. And at my farm, it's getting worse. I've got to change the way that I apply nutrients. And uh, I'm going to find out this year, is there a yield penalty to having it all at the surface? And, and I'm going to yield check it. So a year from now, I'll know. Maybe we'll come back again and, and have another one. I hope that all of you will fill out the survey if you'd like us to come back next year, talk a little more about what it does for yield. And, uh, but also, I want you to, if you want to join our national survey, we'll give you the free probe, or you can do what David talked about. Uh, stop by our booth at, uh, at 2638. Also, I believe that this is such a problem in the United States that leads to uh, contaminated water that I've asked uh, Dr. Bilo, and we're gonna sponsor him on Saturday morning. And it's learning how to get the most out of your fertilizer application through key management factors. Um, he's the professor of crop physiology at University of Illinois. Scott is also one of his graduate students that's working on this project. Saturday morning from 8.15 to 9.15. Dr. Bilo, wave your hand up here. And they're gonna be in room 265. So if you wanna learn more from, from the professor side of things, um, that group will be there um, to, uh, to, uh, to talk about that. Um, also, we have some of my soil tests. I copied it right from it came from the lab. So the first sheet shows no tilling for 14 years, what it looks like. The next page is what it, same spot, what it looked like after I'm old board plowed 
And then David and Randy talked about the next going down to the next level from 9 to 16. And I also pulled probes so that you can see what my nutrients look like. And if, hopefully, if you don't take time to do this at your own farm, looking at my data will convince you there is no future to surface applying nutrients. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions, I think, right here. I've got about five or six minutes to go here. Uh, Dr. Bilo's got a mic. Um, his assistant's got a mic. If you've got any questions, uh, wave your hand up here, and uh, one of the three of us will address it. And maybe we did a perfect job, I'm not sure. The other thing is, if you don't ask a question, we have a song and dance routine that we'll break into here pretty quick. So fire, fire away. I think we got one right here. Okay. Yeah, Randy, you talked about killing the corn with the combine. Uh, what's your moisture content, or what's your moisture of your corn, and what are your dry down costs? Uh, we generally start, you know, harvesting around 26, 27 percent moisture, and we try to be done by 21, just to make sure we're not leaving that phantom yield loss on the table. Uh, we we know through next level that you know it's about three bushels a point that we're leaving on the table to let corn dry in the field. So. The corn's alive due to the fact disease has not taken it, we got enough moisture, and we got nutrients. We're keeping it alive. And as far as drying cost, I mean, it used to be irrelevant, but it is more of a factor today. We had an ethanol plant that has since closed, but we could take 25% moisture corn to them, and they charged us 19 cents a bushel on uh, drying cost. All right, that awesome. That was cheap. So for us, it's a non-issue. Dr. Bilo, have you got a question over here? Yes, sir, fire away. Yeah, I'm from northern Illinois, and I started playing with cover crops a few years ago, and I really don't have any data to tell if it's working or not. But on the stratification part, how much green growth do you need to even make any difference on that? Because we don't get very much growth with our cover crops. When are you killing it? Um... I don't have enough nerve to let the rye grow till um, it's three foot tall and plant in the spring in that. I want to get rid of it, but sometimes we'll maybe let it get... Why get rid of it? Four, five, six inches tall before we kill it. Why get rid of it? Let it grow to knee high and figure out a way to plant through it. That's what we're doing. We plant through it and leave the residue on top of the ground. Well, we had 17 inches of rain last year and you said you had 60. That's why we get rid of it, to, so it's not <laughs> sucking all the moisture out. I understand, but it actually will help hold moisture, believe it or not. Um, we like, what if you're extremely wet and you need some of that moisture to go bye-bye? How many people put in tile to get rid of excess moisture? It'd be nice to have something actually taking that moisture up. So we believe that, you know, leaving that residue on top of the ground, let it take up as much water and as much nutrients as it wants to, and then... When we kill it and plant through it, all of that residual fertility that's in that mass, that biomass above ground, it's going to release it back to where? That crop during the season. So that's another reason why we want to let growth get there. We don't want to kill it and then hair it in or disc it in, et cetera. We leave it on top of the ground and it, by the end of the season, it doesn't exist and those nutrients went to the next crop. We're going to move to one more question over yep, here on the right hand one side. Right here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes. Uh, Randy, I'm in the largest poultry growing area in the United States, North Georgia, and I think you're getting some of our litter. Uh, for David, too, all right, broadcasting to poultry litter is what we do. We're 100% no-till, 100% cover crop. Applying litter on top of the ground, like we're having to do now, does the soil warrior or are there other uh, mechanisms to try to get these nutrients from poultry litter down in the ground six inches. We haven't found that to work very well to get it down. It's all well, broadcast top. Right. Obviously, the deeper you place it, the easier it is to, to you know, to, to accomplish your goals. But what we're doing is we're surface applying it. We plant a cover crop. We incorporate. We'll plant. We'll spread the, the the poultry litter ahead of the the seed that we're broadcasting. We'll incorporate it one to two inches in planting that seed, and then from that point on. When we pull our soil samples from 0 to 8, it's 8 to 16 to 16 to 24, we have very little variation now since the last 10 years of doing that. So having something growing constantly, I feel like it's actually pulling that nutrient deeper into the profile. 
Does a machine like a turbo till help incorporate well, you, you, and push you can it down? for two inches. Yeah, two so inches. as deep as you're actually running the equipment. But I'm depending on the roots to do the work more than t a machine to do the work. And if you're doing the turbo till now, you probably you might be creating another problem called compaction. Yes, very. So I, I, I would kind of steer away from that. And then you've also you've mixed that up. You get a big rain. Now you got some soil that can actually move. And then you're losing your fertilizer in another capacity. Because how many times I hear when Randy gets his five inches of rain and he didn't, he didn't work some ground up, that soil's moved. Well, we run a ripper at least uh, sometime fall or spring, about 10 inches. And uh, it seems to open the ground up for water to get in. And it humps it up a little bit and packs it back down. So it is uh, letting nutrients in, but it's 16 inches apart. You don't want to put it that close. So I'm just trying to figure a way to get that all those nutrients since I've hear, heard you all today. It'd be great to figure out, a, uh, a, and I've asked Brad Maddox, I don't know if he's here, but some of these uh, companies, it, it'd be great. I know they do pelletized chicken litter now. So if you could get pelletized chicken litter um, and place it deep on the back of an Orthman shank or something like that, I think that's a great way to consider it. But it would be really nice to have a way to band chicken litter in that three to eight inch zone, eight to 12 inches deep. Again, I don't know there's a piece of equipment out there that does that today. All right, well, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna hang around up front here to answer some questions. Now, both Randy yeah. and David. Wait, wait, wait one wait. second, Marion, okay, before. Wait, wait a second, come on, no, all right, go ahead. Before you do that. Make um, them run us out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we'll, answer I, we, we'll answer questions. I mean, we're not gonna do questions right now. We're getting ready to close up. Um, I, I wanna close in one, one more thing, y'all. We've just come off a horrible, whatever this COVID thing was, I just buried my dad New Year's Eve and we got to realize that there's an appointment that we're all going to meet at some point in time. And we're getting ready to start doing something, harvest, I mean, planting season, we're going to get extremely busy. We're going to do things that are foolish and careless. Farming is a very dangerous occupation. I had an uncle fall off a grain bin and pass away. I had my, one of my, grand, you know, we all have these, you know, everybody, if we've been farming long enough, something's happened to somebody. So as, before we close, I would like to take an opportunity, if we could just bow our heads and I could give us a word of prayer. You betcha. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just ever so grateful for this chance to come together so we could um, just share some fellowship and some information with each and every one of us. As we come upon the season in which you've challenged us to feed the world, and as we're in an unsafe environment here across the whole globe, just be with all those that are fighting and be with those on both sides because we understand that that it is just not a thing that they wish to have happen, dear Lord. And just look over each and every one of us as we come to do the things that you've challenged us. And at some point in time, we just want to be welcome to you, and you just look upon us and say, well, job, my child. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray, amen. 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 And uh, with that, I want to say, uh, don't forget to fill out the survey uh, about what you heard today. Also, stop by our booth if you want to get a probe, if you want to pick up this data and look at it yourself. And the other thing is, these two guys agreed. Come on, guys. You agreed. They're going to put the hats on. And if you want to get a, <laughs> come on, if, and if you want to get a hat and, and you want a photo op, uh, stop by our booth. We also have a little merry-go-round for the little kids, so feel free to stop by. You guys look phenomenal. That, that is just awesome. That was worth the whole time. You've been a great audience. Thank, let's give a nice big round of applause to these two gentlemen. Thank you.